Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Welcome to Mashura Group's latest webinar. My name is Louis Ishaq. I am a partner at Mashura Group. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Mashura Group is a boutique consulting firm focused on the Middle East and Africa with particular interest in the intersection of policy, good governance, and sustainable business. Today's topic is about the role of hydrogen in the GCC, the Gulf Council, uh, and the concept of the circular carbon economy. The urgency to meet zero carbon emissions in the world is increasing as we feel firsthand the impacts of climate change. At the same time, the demand for energy is not going anywhere. As a matter of fact, it's increasing as developing economies advance and require more energy intensive lifestyles. So where does this leave the GCC? The GCC has been an energy powerhouse for the world for the past decades. Will the GCC be able to utilize its natural advantages, its wealth, infrastructure, talent, and natural resources to cement its place in the new world energy system? These are some of the questions our panelists will help answer for us today. Now I'd like to welcome our panelists. Today we are going to hear from three esteemed guests. Ian Sims, Principal Advisor at IGM Energy, Rami Shabana, Senior Associate at Capsarc, and Frank Waters, VP Business Development, VP Global Business Development, Low Carbon Hydrogen at Worley. Our first speaker is Ian Sims. Ian is an oil and gas professional with significant experience providing energy and geopolitical analysis and market intelligence to C-level audience. He also advised on asset acquisition and business development in the energy and industrial sectors throughout Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Louis. Uh, let me just share my screen. Yeah. Do you have my screen up now? Yes. Wonderful. Great. So thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as Louis said, my name is Ian Sim. I'm a principal advisor at IGM Energy based in the UK. I'd like to speak a little bit about some of the projects that are already underway uh, throughout the GCC for oil and gas companies to uh, lead the energy transition in the region. So the first thing to, to, to take note of is the vast importance of oil and gas throughout the, the, the region and the, the long lasting role that this will have, whether we move to renewables, hydrogen, or any other uh, type of energy. Hydrocarbons has brought vast wealth and rapid uh, facilitated rapid development throughout the GCC. Uh, another important point to note is that while the Middle East dominates global hydrocarbon production, it trails in clean energy. That's to say that it's behind the Americas, Asia and Europe in terms of investments in renewable uh, and clean tech energy uh, alongside Africa. With huge reserves available, uh, there's been historically little reason for the countries in the GCC to shift towards renewables, particularly when the region has such a vested interest in the continued reliance of the world on uh, oil and gas. And another point to note is that the sector in the, in the uh, GCC throughout the Middle East, in fact, is mainly controlled by state oil firms. And these companies have an overarching responsibility of uh, providing the bulk of state revenue. So while we've got oil and gas uh, as, the, as the kind of bedrock for energy in, in the, the Middle East, we also have a lot of advantages. The Middle East was dealt another favorable hand when it comes to renewables. It has three factors which are vitally important. It has sun, it has land, and it has oil. So let's look into each of these. Sun, there's lots of it. It makes solar very cheap. I believe the, the, the Middle East has some of the cheapest solar, solar projects uh, in the world. Land, there are large unpopulated areas where large scale facilities and projects can be, be developed with relatively little uh, difficulties in terms of, uh, or barriers to, to development, uh, as opposed to Europe or Asia, where there is a high, far higher population density. And oil not necessarily the upstream side of things, but the infrastructure, the expertise and the capital that are already in place throughout the region. This is by absolutely, should be no, there should be no under, uh, underestimation of the fact that the Middle East is a mature energy producing region. 
and that facilitates uh, a, a great level for, upon which to build a renewable industry. Integration is going to be a really important part of this. Saudi Arabia has something like 90 years of uh, oil reserves um, or oil production reserves uh, without making a second uh, uh, any further um, discoveries. So be under no misapprehension. Oil and gas will continue to, to provide the bedrock for any further uh, energy sector that is developed upon that. However, renewables can increase efficiencies for these companies. You take uh, an example of a company like Adnoc or, or Saudi Aramco, which is increasingly looking to international markets for investment. Uh, Aramco did its, uh, its um, Saudi Arabian based IPO last year, and I, uh, the, the company is increasingly looking towards its uh, carbon footprint and, and uh, uh, the role that environmental, social, and governance factors play in attracting further investment. And renewables will play a very important part of this. In addition, while we got integration between facilities, we also have integration between relation uh, companies and, and states. So this uh, creation of a Gulf grid uh, powered by gas and renewables can lead to improved relations between companies and indeed states, uh, which is obviously going to create a, a, a more investable environment in the long run. So there, there are companies that are already looking at uh, complementing their oil and gas operations with renewable energy projects. Um, PDO in Oman, Petroleum Development Oman, is probably one of the most forward thinking of the uh, oil companies in the Middle East. This has been largely because of the, the difficulties it faces with the uh, tough geology that Oman has. And as a result, it has developed uh, the Mira project, which is a solar steam uh, enhanced oil recovery uh, project at the Amal field. Solar, uh, solar panels cr uh, create steam. The steam is fed into the uh, reservoir to increase recovery from, from the oil field. And again, in, uh, with Amin, it has a 100 megawatt solar PV project, which uh, provides uh, energy for remote operations. Uh, PDO has a large, uh, is in control of concessions over large swathes of uh, the Sultanate of Oman, many of which are, are far from uh, grid connectivity. We go back to Aramco. Again, because of the, the, the large scale operations that it has, it's also looking at uh, off grid power generation through, through solar PV uh, at its uh, Wad al Shamal. Uh, unconventional gas operations. So we've seen there, are, there are, you know, these are just a few examples, but the companies in the Middle East, oil companies, which are the, you know, the bedrock of, of the economy and of the energy sector, are already looking to renewable energy as a source of integrating uh, and improving efficiencies in their operations. What I think uh, Frank and uh, Rami will discuss in, in greater detail is the, the role that hydrogen will play in this. And hydrogen is really the key to what we're dis describing as the, the circular carbon economy. Uh, by using oil and gas, uh, sorry, using oil and gas as a feedstock to create hydrogen is becoming increasingly popular. And if the CO2 that's generated is captured, harnessed and, and, and stored, it can be referred to as blue hydrogen one step away from, from green hydrogen, which I believe we'll get to next, uh, slightly later on. However, there are major challenges in, in transporting uh, hydrogen given its instability. So companies are looking to new ways to do this. So introducing uh, nitrogen can result in production of ammonia, which is stable and easy to transport and a product that uh, companies have great deals of, a great deal of experience transporting around the world. We'll go back to Aramco for the best example of this, as Aramco and Japan's Institute of Energy Economics, the IEJ, are in the middle of a, a pilot project to transport, to generate and transport blue ammonia from the eastern province of Saudi Arabia to Japan. So they're taking, how do you know, we'll just talk about the circularity of this, this, this project. The natural gas is taken from the Usmania ga, uh, gas field, it's converted into hydrogen. Uh, in a, a dedicated facility, again, in the Eastern province. Around 50 tons of uh, CO2 
was generated as, during this, this, this conversion process. A good chunk of it was taken to the EO to, uh, to enhance oil recovery back at Uthmania. It goes straight back into the reservoir, increasing production. Other, pa other part, around 30 tons of it, taken off to be processed within a Jubail methanol plant. The nitrogen was added in uh, the Jubail ammonia plant, and uh, blue ammonia has been dispatched to Japan, where it can be separated and used to co-fire turbines and boilers in the country. It's just one example, but it shows how oil companies are looking towards the circular carbon economy and how they can play a role in that. And by assisting countries like Japan, which is heavily in, uh, dependent on, on overseas um, uh, imports of, of oil and gas, uh, Gulf national oil companies can assist uh, overseas company, uh, countries in, uh, in their intended uh, nationally determined contributions, the pledges they made to the UN to tackle con uh, climate change. And I see this as a, a significant opportunity for these companies to, to reposition themselves as, as part of the solution uh, to climate change. Thank you. Thanks, Ian, for, for your presentation. Um, yeah, we, it's, it's interesting bringing the topic of, of blue hydrogen uh, versus green hydrogen. I think that's something that we're going to hear more of uh, in, in, in our discussion today. The concept of going to green hydrogen from the start, it does seem to be uh, challenging and it'd be, to be seen how will that progress? Because it seems that the world, the, the issue of hydrogen is complex. You've got the issue of having to use it in fuel cells or power plants, cement factories, the technology there needs to be developed or to use it as ammonia, green ammonia. And then the technology of making the hydrogen. So the easier path with the path with low resistance seems to be in the blue hydrogen. Now there is some uh, toxin from what I understand that there's announcement in Europe, uh, maybe I think Frank, you, could, you mentioned that to me when we spoke before that uh, green ammonia or like green hydrogen is the way to go. Um, so that might might change how the attitude is towards blue hydrogen, but from a from a like a practicality point of view, it does seem that it has a lot of advantages. So we'll we'll hear more on that as we go. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So our second speaker is Frank Waters. Frank has been leading renewable energy projects, transactions, and technology development for 30 years and played a leading role in the development of renewable energy projects valued to over $5 billion. Currently, Frank serves as VP Global Business Development, Low Carbon Hydrogen at Worley. Frank, the floor is yours. Yes, thanks, uh, Luai. Um, so indeed, uh, today you'll hear a little bit about uh, clean hydrogen and, and the potential in the GCC. Um, the, um, the flow of the presentation is that first we take a step back and look at the big picture of energy, uh, then uh, focus on the, the role of hydrogen in the energy transition, uh, and then lastly we look at some of the uh, aspects in the GCC. Now, there is, um, I mean, we've been, for, for more than 100 years, we've been burning hydrocarbons, and uh, that, that, uh, that has given us tremendous economic development, uh, wealth, uh, and well-being. Uh, and, and it's sometimes hard to take a step back uh, and, and see, uh, you know, can we do without? Because, um, you know, obviously burning hydrocarbons is associated with climate change uh, and something needs to, needs to happen. We need to do something. Um, and, and, you know, can, can we actually replace hydrocarbons with uh, renewables? And, and this picture shows that in a, in a graphic way uh, and, and it sort of drives uh, the, the point home that it is possible. If, if you were to think of, of generating all the energy needs of the planet with solar, uh, you would only need 10% of the surface uh, of Australia or 8% of the Sahara Desert. And there's plenty of, of empty space to, to, to do that. Obviously you wouldn't do it, but you know it, it, it's just to make that point. And if you were to do, would try to do the same uh, only offshore wind, one and a half percent of the Pacific Ocean uh, would suffice for all the energy needs that, that we have. Obviously, I mean, this is this is not what you what you're going to do. But um, you know, in terms of potential, uh, absolutely no problem. 
Now let's look at, at hydrogen. Uh, Ian already mentioned, um, you know, some of the, the issues around it. And I've, I've decided to focus on Germany because we've got good data on that. And, you know, this is uh, the, the current energy demand in Germany. It's about 2,500 terawatt hours. And, uh, you know, we get very excited when we see, you know, the growth of, of renewable energy in the mix of, of the electricity system. But we also have to realize that electricity, you know, the part that's covered by electrons on the left uh, is only 20% of, uh, of final energy. So uh, even though renewable power is a substantial and growing part of that, the overall piece of the pie that electricity makes in the, in the overall energy system, it's only 20%. And 80% uh, are molecules. That's coal, that's gas, uh, that, that's, um, you know, fuels, diesel, uh, kerosene, and, and all of those things. And, you know, there's a, a small but growing share of biofuels in, in that. Um, but, you know, obviously the question is, uh, and Germany is, is dedicated to become, uh, you know, net zero carbon by 2050, which is 30 years from now, like the rest of the European Union and many other member states. So what does that mean? How does this picture look in, in 30 years from now? Now, on, on the left, um, you know, we, it, it's, it's, it's fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, new renewables are now cost effective. Ian already alluded to that fact in this region, but it's the same in Germany. Uh, and any new generation, um, you know, solar and wind are, are, are more cost effective than anything else. So it's relatively straightforward uh, to, in the next 30 years, to convert your electricity system to run on variable renewables. Um, but you also have to understand that uh, that has to grow. I mean, 20% is not enough, so that will grow. Electrification is a major part of the energy transition. Uh, so let's say roughly half, half of your final energy will be electricity. And then the main question is, what is the other half? And there's a few options to do that. Of course, we can still keep burning carbon and capture the CO2, CCS, that is what, uh, what was also shown before. Uh, we can do biofuels. There's limitations to, to those options. First of all, for CCS, you need geography. For biofuels, we're competing with you know, food and, and, and land use and, and all of those things. And then you, when you then arrive at hydrogen as a molecule uh, to make the electricity system work, and I'll get back to that later, um, you know, there's very few limitations to hydrogen. You can make hydrogen from sunshine, wind, uh, and, and, and water, uh, and, and you can also turn uh, hydrogen, as Ian already showed, you can turn it into liquids and, and other substances that, uh, that can fulfill very important functions in the, in the economy. So in my view, there is very few that can do, very few things that, that can do what hydrogen can do if you're thinking about a, a system that has to be net zero carbon in, in, in 30 years from now. And these are the seven functions that, uh, that hydrogen fulfill to the left. It's actually making that 50% electricity system work because, I mean, the sun shines during the day, the wind blows when the wind blows, but you need storage, you need uh, uh, backup, you need flexibility enablers, and hydrogen is something that can do that. It's very cost efficient uh, to transport a gas, much more cheap, much cheaper than transporting electricity, and we can store gas. That's a very, very important aspect of uh, hydrogen in the energy system going forward. We cannot store electricity. You can convert it in a battery, you can pump it up a mountain, but in the end, electri electricity is, is a flowing electron. You cannot, you cannot store electricity, you can only convert it. Hydrogen is a gas, it's a molecule, you can store that, and you can store it over the season. Very important part of, of uh, you know, the equation. And the four cases, the four main use cases for hydrogen, it's in transport, it's an industrial energy use, the high temperature heat we need in industry, uh, it's to make steel, it's to, uh, uh, you know, heat buildings and, 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 and convert back to power, but it's also a very important uh, driver of, of clean feedstock in the ammonia industry for fertilizers, for steel uh, and refining and, and all of those things. Now let's uh, focus on, on, on the GCC. Because, um, I mean, this is the, 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 the picture, the, the current picture of, of energy flows from to and from the GCC. We see the large, the large brown bubble, uh, you know, on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, it's a, a massive net import, uh, export of energy. And, and if you look at the large and dark blue circles, that's, uh, you know, Asia Pacific and Europe, those are net importers. So those are the people that buy oil and gas uh, predominantly from, from the Middle East. Um, 
and, and that is going to change. And, and this is, this is the, the, the same picture, if you will, uh, if, if we're going to shift towards a hydrogen-based economy. And the main difference is that um, you know, there is going to be new areas for, for low cost production. Uh, if, if you're looking at the dark blue areas, it's Chile, it's, it's Canada, it's Australia, places that have space, as Ian already said, you need, you need space that have a good renewable energy resource. They're going to be uh, competitive in the production uh, of these, these green molecules. And if you then look at Europe, um, uh, or even India, but, but Europe, uh, it, it, even in the future of, of, uh, of energy, they're going to be net importers. Just, there's just not enough space. The resource is not good enough for Europe to entirely cover its energy demand uh, with um, you know, homemade hydrogen. So they're going to look towards partners that uh, are going to supply uh, those future uh, fuels. And, this region uh, is, is predestined to, to, become, to become one of those partners. And then if, if we you know, now would like to take a few minutes on, on the focus on, on Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. So Saudi um, has three uh, you know, strategic projects in, uh, in, in the Saudi Agenda 2030 and, and NEOM uh, is, is a, well, they call it a city, but if you look at it, it's the size of Belgium, 26,000 square kilometers in the northwestern corner of the, of the country. Um, $500 billion investment by the PIF. There's going to be a multitude of that. A million people are going to live there. And it's actually, frankly, a very beautiful, uh, it's a very beautiful space. They don't want carbon in NEOM. So it's going to be entirely uh, free from fossil fuels. It will be, uh, it will be run 100% uh, on renewable energy. And then if you think that through, if you're thinking of a combination of solar and wind for electricity, you need hydrogen. There's just no other way to make that work, and um, and and this is this is the reason why. And this is unique to uh, that corner of the country. Uh, the the orange blob in the middle is the daily solar profile. I mean, it's you know the sun goes up, uh, you know it, it rises and and it sets in the evening every day. But the the, the unique um, uh, position uh, for Neom is is that they have also thermal winds. And, and the thermal winds are like clockwork. It's like the sun going up and down. Every afternoon, the wind picks up. So the moment the sun goes down, the wind picks up. And the combination of the two uh, provides a, a unique, um, you know, if, if you will, combination of 72% of base load. So if, if you were to build a system, half of it sun, half of it wind, you would have 72% of, of the time in the year you would have electricity. And that is very, very competitive. If you connect that to an electrolyzer to make uh, green hydrogen, uh, you know, the sunshine is good, the wind is good, but the combination provides, you know, a unique uh, position in that sense. And, and Worley, for full uh, disclosure, we've been working with Neon for the last year in uh, trying to understand, you know, what that means, how you can build a business, you know, who would buy the product. Uh, and, and now we're getting into uh, the actual realization. Now, these, these are some of the considerations. Uh, the, the fact that it's, it's, it's competitive, it can be competitive. You know, you can look at domestic markets, but you know, main short-term uh, focus is actually on, on export. So uh, they're gonna make um, uh, ammonia, but there's, it's gonna be a combination of a pilot plant, but there's gonna be an, an ammonia facility at scale. Uh, and these are the, the three steps that, that we're looking at right now. So the, the pilot uh, project uh, is also going to look at various different products. So we're going to make hydrogen, but there's also, you know, consideration about methanol, other other uh, fuels that you can make with hydrogen as the basis. Uh, and and then you've you've probably heard about the five billion dollar announcement, the combination of Neom, um, Aqua Power from from Saudi and Air Products that are building this uh, this world class uh, scale, 1.2 million ton uh, green ammonia. Uh, at, at NEOM, completely carbon-free, uh, and that uh, is going to provide uh, ammonia for, for world markets, but it's huge. It's $5 billion, two gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity. And then when that, you know, when that is done, there is no end. They're going to continue building capacity because of, you know, unique uh, competitive nature of, of the location. Now, if we then uh, look, uh, look at home, and this is a, a thought experiment that I, I have uh, done myself a while back. 
um, you know, as, as Ian already said, the region is blessed with, you know, very low cost hydrocarbons, so both Saudi Arabia as well as the United Arab Emirates, but, but also in terms of, uh, of sunshine. So the, the lowest cost uh, large scale solar plants in the world are actually here. They're in the United Arab Emirates as well as in Saudi. And that, and that opens uh, opportunities. And, and, you know, if we're then looking at cars, a car, uh, and, and if, if we, you know, look at a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, then inside that there is actually a power plant. So you have a, a hundred kilowatt fuel cell that runs on hydrogen that produces power. And we use that power to drive the vehicle. Now, a car is, is one of the most stranded assets that we have uh, because we're only using uh, our cars an hour a day. So 23 hours in the day, the cars are standing there. Now, if, that is a, if that's a power plant, if that's a fuel cell, a 100 kilowatt fuel cell, perhaps there is something we can do with that. And this is, um, you know, these are some of the numbers. We have about 5 million cars in, uh, in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, we drive about 100 billion kilometers each year. So to do that with hydrogen would require 1 billion, so a million ton of, of hydrogen uh, per year. But the idea is to connect those fuel cells, the 23 hours of the day that we're not using the car to connect it to the grid to actually produce electricity for the grid. And to do that, you will need about 140, so you need an additional 5 billion kilos of, uh, of hydrogen, for, not just for the driver, but then also for the electricity for the grid. You will need uh, 141 gigawatts of, of, of solar PV, of course, matching electrolyzers. Uh, in terms of, of land use, it's, it's uh, less than 4%. It's about the same size that we have farming land, and there's plenty of space in, in the United Arab Emirates. And we would have lab cost, production cost uh, below $2 per kilo. Um, and then if we have a system like that, um, we can provide, we can drive uh, on, on, on green hydrogen, but we can also provide the electricity system with all the power that it needs. Uh, and in addition, uh, you know, we also produce 5% of the residential drinking water. And if we do that, we don't need any additional conventional power plants. Um, just because we're using the cars a little bit more uh, efficiently than, uh, than, than we do that right now. So the cars would drive an hour a day, uh, and in addition, a few hours per day, they would, they would produce power. In terms of money, uh, what does it mean? Uh, it, the, the driving is actually 50% cheaper. If, you, if you're able to produce hydrogen for $2 per kilo, uh, it will be half than what you're paying right now at the pump for gasoline. Cost of electricity is about seven cents, which is roughly in the same ballpark as, as what we have now. So it's, it's, not, it's not impossible and it's not unaffordable. And with that, um, I'm, I'm at the end of my talk. Thanks, Frank. Uh, really, uh... Uh, liked your vision on on the UAE uh, and how it can do the hydrogen, two dollars per kilogram. That's that's really, you know, a good number if we can achieve that. Well, I mean, Neom is is uh, is targeting one and a half, so it's re it's really achievable. All right. Um, so, last but not least, our final presenter for the day is Rami Shabana. Rami is a senior research associate at the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center, or CAPSARC. Focused on global gas and liquid markets, Rami has over 13 years of research and industry experience analyzing energy market and energy policy. Rami has presented on the circular carbon economy and the role of hydrogen, and we look forward to hearing more from him on this topic. Rami, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Louis. Can you see my screen, uh, the full slideshow? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yeah, thanks, Louis, and uh, also like to thank uh, uh, the Mashura Group for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, my talk will revolve around uh, some of the work that CAPSARC has led in the area of carbon or uh, circular carbon economy. <clears throat> um, I will also talk about how hydrogen can play a role uh, under this framework as a clean energy vector and an enabler uh, to manage carbon emissions. Um, just to give you uh, some info about CAPSARC, uh, we are an independent think tank based in Riyadh and we research um, uh, in the field of uh, energy economics, uh, policy and environment. Um, and in this past year, we've been working a lot on the Circular Carbon Economy Guide, uh, which uh, has been widely used by the G20 energy ministers uh, under Saudi Arabia's leadership for the G20 this year. Um, in fact, they just endorsed it uh, in September. 
uh, and acknowledged it um, as a holistic and a pragmatic approach to uh, managing carbon, uh, carbon emissions. Um, so what is the circular carbon economy? It's a, it's a concept that offers a new way of approaching climate goals uh, and implicitly values all options uh, and efforts uh, to mitigate carbon emissions. Um, it, it builds on the existing model of the circular economy, which has been around since the 1970s. Um, and what the circular economy focuses on is, is the resource and waste management, uh, basically ensures that resources uh, are kept in as, uh, uh, or kept in use for as long as possible. And the circular economy um, uses the principles of the three R's, which is reduce, you know, reducing the amount of resources needed um, and reducing the waste as much as possible, uh, as well as reusing and recycling. The circular carbon economy is the same concept. It's an, it's an extension of that. Uh, it focuses on, uh, but it focuses on energy and carbon flows. Um, and it uses the same principles as reduce, reuse, and recycle, uh, but it adds a fourth R, which is re remove. And in this case, removing carbon from the atmosphere and uh, sequestering it in, in geological formations or natural sinks. Um, it's important to note that there's uh, no order to this hierarchy. Um, uh, that's the beauty of it, actually. Uh, and how much of the, the four R's contribute is really dependent on the region and the constraint that you have, which uh, you know both Ian and, and Frank talked about. Uh, it depends on the cost and performance of technologies, resource availability, and you know the, the enabling uh, policies. Um, so in this slide, I'll illustrate how the four R's uh, come together to uh, close the carbon loop. Uh, but before that, it may be useful to first define what the linear economy is, which assumes that the linear economy assumes that resources are limitless and that the ability for the Earth to absorb waste is also limitless. Um, in the context of a linear carbon economy, it's the same thing. Um, as you can see in the picture here, hydrocarbon resources are extracted to supply energy. Uh, whether it's for human use or economic activity, um, and in the process uh, emits carbon into the atmosphere, uh, which is largely what we're doing now, and uh, that's it results in environmental problems such as uh, cl climate change. Um, in the in the circular carbon economy, uh, it recognizes uh, the Earth's limits to absorbing CO2, uh, and aims in this case uh, reducing the fugitive carbon emissions. So one way you could do this is through energy efficiency. Which, which reduces the consumption of energy, uh, leads to reduction in emissions. Um, another way to reduce emissions is to introduce nuclear or non-bio-renewables, bio such as solar and wind. Um, carbon can also be recycled uh, by allowing carbon to go through the natural uh, carbon cycle in which uh, CO2 in the atmosphere is converted via photosynthesis. Um, you can use that to grow biomass and then uh, harvest that for bioenergy. Uh, of course, the releasing carbon emissions from bioenergy into the atmosphere uh, will not result in a net addition of CO2 as long as the new biomass growth uh, replaces the harvested uh, uh, one. Um, carbon can, can be removed, as I mentioned. Um, you can capture the carbon from a point source or using uh, direct air capture. Um, this could be used with hydrocarbons or even bioenergy. If it's used with bioenergy, it can even result in negative emissions. Um, and then alternatively, carbon uh, that is captured can be reused uh, in many applications uh, in chemical industry, EOR, and so on. Uh, so this is the basic illustration of the circular carbon economy framework. And you can tell many technologies and pathways can uh, contribute to, uh, to, to managing this carbon. Um, so how does hydrogen fit into the uh, circular carbon economy or the CCE framework? Uh, well. Switching to low carbon hydrogen production and given its versatility in many application, uh, it can be used uh, or it can really enable clean energy systems. Um, in fact, hydrogen is ideally suited. We see it spanning across all the four R's, as you can see in the picture. Um, it can reduce carbon emissions by replacing existing gray hydrogen, for example, gray hydrogen production. You can replace it with blue or green hydrogen. Um, this is from the production side, but even from the demand side, you can substitute hydrocarbons with uh, in hydrogen mobility, for example, so that reduces emissions as well. Uh, hydrogen could also be uh, a route for uh, recycling carbon, where hydrogen can be produced from biomass, where the CO2 can be managed through the natural ca carbon cycles that we mentioned in the past slide. But also carbon can be combined with hydrogen uh, to create synthetic fuels. Um, 
hydrogen can be also an enabler for CCS and remove carbon from the atmosphere uh, using blue hydrogen or removing it from biomass derived hydrogen uh, and sequestering it in geological storage. Um, and finally, reuse um, carbon could be reused with hydrogen. That, uh, carbon emission that is captured during the production process um, could be reused, for example, in an EOR process or even in a supercritical CO2 power generation, um, if you want to look at novel technologies. Uh, so you can see that hydrogen can really help in closing that carbon loop and make it a cross-cutting enabler for uh, the low carbon economy. Um, obviously, the transition to a low carbon hydrogen is, uh, is not easy. Uh, there are various barriers to overcome. Uh, there are economic barriers, technical and even social barriers. Of course, the government support is really important in the early phases to kickstart the, uh, the wide adoption of hydrogen. Um, here are some of the, the policies that can enable this. First, it's really important to set targets and give long-term policy signals to stakeholders. Uh, these could be in the form of hydrogen roadmaps, strategies, and we've really seen that on a national level um, uh, across the world, um, putting demand targets for hydrogen use. Um, a long-term vision is very important for stakeholders uh, to give them confidence to invest uh, and show them that there is a future marketplace for low carbon hydrogen. Um, second, hydrogen use uh, also needs to be expanded. Government have to uh, support demand creation um, they can do that by putting an economic value on hydrogen um, so that hydrogen could be used in different applications. Uh, they could do that in the form of CO2 pricing, tax credits, etc., uh, to incentivize uh, low carbon hydrogen. Um, and actually that brings us to the next item, which is trying to make hydrogen projects bankable uh, and demand creation on its own may not be uh, sufficient. Uh, we need uh, policies that can address investment risks uh, this can enable, you know, stakeholders or investors to cross this so-called valley of death. Um, and that could be, you know, done by providing soft loans, uh, tax breaks, um, as well as forming public and private partnerships. Um, and of course, further cost reductions can be attained through research and development. Uh, here, governments can uh, set research agendas and provide direct project funding. Um, and finally, you know, to have a smooth transition to a low carbon hydrogen economy, um, governments need to remove social barriers and harmonize standards, you know, agreeing on safety standards, distribution, purity and pressures. Um, we also need robust accounting standards and methods to account and verify for CO2 emissions across the uh, value chain. Um, so these are all really important uh, policies uh, or enablers that uh, in order to kickstart this hydrogen economy. Uh, bringing it close to home, uh, I want to leave you with some, some of the thoughts on the potential for the opportunities in the GCC region and becoming a, a hydrogen hub. And Frank and Ian both uh, um, presented some of that. Uh, there are many factors that can make this plausible. Um, first, that there's a lot of industrial experience based in the oil and gas industry that we can build on. Um, you can build large facilities and usually things can be done on economies of scale. Uh, things are just done much larger uh, than other places here. Uh, second, there's regulatory speed. Um, the, the regulatory process is very streamlined uh, in which you don't need to wait a long time to, to get a permit, for example, to build. You can build something once, once, once a decision is being made. Um, thirdly, the, the region has a geographic and logistical advantage. You know, it's located within easy shipping distances to, to large and growing energy markets. Uh, look at the project at Nyon, for example. It's well placed uh, next to the uh, Suez Canal. It can go directly to Europe if it wishes to sell there. Um, another thing that is important is that the GCC has a counter-cyclical energy demand uh, compared to the uh, hydrogen buyers. Um, most of the energy demand requirements for the GCC is during the summer, uh, and that's primarily for air conditioning. Uh, but during the winter, when there is high demand for Europe or Asia for heating, uh, and the demand is low here in the winter, you can take advantage of the seasonal pricing difference. Um, so, uh, and last, of course, last but not least, is, uh, is the funds uh, for investments, uh, you know, being or having a centralized governance structure uh, allows you to get uh, projects or goals and put money towards it, uh, such as the project in Neom. So, um, I'll, uh, I'll stop here and I'll, uh, if you wanted to know more about the circular carbon economy guide uh, that CAPSRC has been working with and the uh, other reports that we've engaged international organizations with, um, you can visit cce guide.org. 
And Luay, I'll, uh, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks, Rami. Uh, appreciate your talk. It is definitely um, complex. Like when you look at what is required to make a carbon economy from a policy perspective, how can you incentivize an in industry um, to, to act? How can I incentivize, you know, cement factories, big freight companies, manufacturers, OEMs? Uh, at the same time, if you do have independent, uh, you know, uh, energy uh, producers, how can I incentivize them to produce hydrogen rather than gas or something else? And along, you know, there's other jurisdictions in the world that have uh, already been engaged in on providing policy in that view. Like uh, I think three weeks ago, for example, uh, the government of uh, Alberta, the province of Alberta in Canada issued um, a new incentive uh, program for making uh, products out of natural gas, whether it's petrochemicals or hydrogen, because they see the path that way. Um, so that's, that's just a number of things that highlight the difficulties in policy. So 100% I agree with what you're, what you're saying, uh, economics as well as, as policy is key. Um, so now that we, we have gone through the presentations, I'd like to answer some of the questions and answers that we've received. I will start with Ian, if you don't mind. So Ian, uh, first couple of questions we have here. What does the renewable turn mean for oil and gas companies? How do they try to adapt and should they adapt in your opinion? Thank you very much for that, Louis. I, I believe it was uh, David, was it uh, David Milne that left that question. Um, so my, in my opinion, well, actually, as, as my presentation showed, that there has already been a, a bit of an uptake um, uh, from certain companies within the Middle East. Uh, there are kind of two ways to look at this question. One is Gulf state uh, oil companies, and the other is oil and gas companies more broadly. Adnoc and, and, and Aramco have already really begun to engage with renewables. And, and as I understand it, they're actively looking to increase their investments in this area. Um, these types of companies benefit from the financial power that they wield. I mean, they, they have uh, earnings that you know, very few companies in the world can compare with. Uh, and this allows them to run large R&D departments to improve the efficiency of their operations and integrate renewables into them. Uh, so you know, broadly speaking, they are doing that. Um, however, the, the pressure on them is perhaps uh, not as great as uh, oil and gas companies, more uh, more broadly speaking. I mean, we've seen BP, to a lesser extent, Shell and Total already try to embrace the energy transition. They've announced, you know, uh, programs that we would probably never have envisaged five years ago, even three years ago, uh, shifting their focus from uh, upstream to energy. So they're now, well, at least in BP's uh, case, it's gone from a, an international oil company to an international energy company, or at least it would like us to see it that way. Um, I think this is an indication of the realization that, there, that this move needs to be made because of the growing public opinion uh, that is against companies in the extractives industry. Um, I also mentioned previously the, the importance of scoring well against uh, environmental, social and governance criteria in terms of being investable for trusts, for funds, for, um, for, for pension funds. Um, and that's a, another really important factor. And I think that we will continue to see, it. I mean, the smaller privately owned, uh, you know, this isn't to sound uh, cynical, but the smaller privately owned companies and the large state owned companies outside uh, Europe and North America are going to have a, a very different attitude towards this than publicly listed majors that have a, you know, already have a reputation for them. Um, thanks, Ian. I got the question from David. It's uh, given the limited cooperation or integration in the GCC on energy currently, 
how do you see the future of a grid connected GCC take off and what is the ne what is necessary to achieve that? I think you've touched on that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I meant I, I responded to that one in the in the, in the Q and A, but I'll, I'll just to, to kind of for, for those who haven't seen it, I believe that there's a, a growing impetus among uh, Middle Eastern governments to increase their uh, um, to strengthen the, the ties between them. Um, an important part of this would be uh, increased grid connectivity. Uh, to sp uh, from a from a purely political point of view, with Saudi Arabia and Iraq have been talking about large gas development. Gas is a big problem for Iraq because much of it is flared. They're struggling to 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 uh, generate their own electricity because of that, and still rely on Iran for a lot of electricity and gas. From a from a um, political perspective. Engaging with uh, Iraq from Saudi Arabia would would allow them to a create a stronger uh, sphere of influence in uh, Iraq, but also uh, decrease Iraq's reliance on Iran uh, and poten potentially Iran's influence in, in Iraq as a result. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Frank, uh, if you don't mind being next, uh, so. I'll try to go through the questions as much as possible, uh, time permitting. Uh, one question that I find uh, necessary to ask here, given the GCC arid areas, uh, do you believe fresh water needs during hydro project production present an issue for countries like GCC where there is, there is uh, no, fr or there's very little fresh water? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and that's certainly something that, uh, you know, we, we need to consider. Uh, because indeed, um, you know, uh, electrolysis is water splitting using el electricity, so you, you need water, and, and it actually needs to be quite pure water in, the, in an electrolyzer. Um, so you have to add in, in the Gulf, you have to, you know, use seawater, because as you already said, there is no, not enough, uh, you know, fresh water available. Uh, and, and, and that requires, first of all, additional electricity and then reverse osmosis. In terms of overall cost and volumes, it's actually not that bad. So the overall uh, additional cost, if you don't have sweet water, but you need um, you need uh, to use salt, salt water from the sea, um, it's less than two percent of the overall cost uh, picture for hydrogen. Um, the, the main problem is actually that you don't want to uh, put the brine back into the sea, and this is an active policy of many countries in the region. Um, and, and that adds a little bit to the cost. At the same time, uh, what, what people are now, uh, you know, more and more uh, doing is, is actually using, um, you know, my, mining the minerals, if you will, out of the brine. So there is uh, a lot of potential uh, to actually monetize, uh, you know, the magnesium, the potassium, the, the aluminium, all, all the stuff, and, and the sodium, everything that you have in the brine and, and uh, you know, and, and sell that on the market. And that to some extent offsets the additional cost of, uh, of the sea mining technology. But overall, uh, we can use seawater and there is technologies available uh, to, uh, to avoid uh, brine discharge, which, which you don't want to do because it would, uh, you know, affect marine life. Uh, thanks, Frank. I have a few more questions. I'll summarize them in one. So uh, questions wondering about cost. So what, what, is, what is needed to, to fund massive uh, hydrogen project in terms of investment? What is in your view required? As well as do you believe there would be or there is regional competition in the hydrogen field or cooperation in the GCC area? So uh, let me start uh, with um, uh, the second. I, I think at the moment uh, people are doing projects. I mean, uh, the NEON project is, uh, is, is one, uh, and I'm not sure that would be an immediate angle for cooperation, for example, with a neighbor. Um, you know, there is also limited uh, uh, cooperation in the oil and gas field. So why would that all of a sudden be uh, when we're making these products? You know, it, it's a market that you want to make money. Uh, if your neighbor makes the same, then you're competing. I mean, that, that's just the bottom line, in, in my view. In terms of uh, what it needs to bring the cost down, in the end, uh, basically what, you, what you're looking at is, is a technology. Uh, so whether it's a, a solar panel to produce electricity from sunshine or a wind turbine to produce electricity from wind or an electrolyzer, 
uh, to, to produce hydrogen from water and, and electricity. The more you make it, the cheaper it gets. And this is something that we've seen in the last 10 years. So if, if you 10 years ago, solar was the most expensive form of power uh, in, in the region and, and probably uh, anywhere. Right now, solar is by a large margin, the cheapest form of power. And the, the, the plain reason for that is because we're making it at scale. So if you have a factory that makes product at scale, you can better uh, you manage your supply chain. You're, you're able to invest in R&D to get you, uh, your, your efficiency up. It's just a matter of doing it. And that is what, what you know, is reflected in, in what you call a learning curve. So the, the learning curve for solar, for example, for solar cells, is, it's, it's a bit more than 20%. So every doubling of capacity, reduces your cost by 21%. For, electro, uh, for electrolysis, uh, initial evidence shows that, you know, the learning curve for electrolysis may be maybe 18%, but there is, it's, a, it's a very, you know, statistically, it's a small base. Uh, but but the, the bottom line is there may be a cost gap now. It may be expensive because we're not making it at scale yet, but once you make it at scale, it'll become uh, cost competitive, no doubt. So the, the main question is, how, how, do you, how do you bring the cost gap uh, down to the level where it can compete? Uh, and one of the answers is, is doing stuff at scale. And that's why the, the NEON project is big. It's, um, you know, it, it's a 1.2 million ton ammonia facility, 200,000 tons of, of hydrogen. The, the largest electrolyzer that we have on the planet right now is 10 megawatts. Uh, they're going to have 120 megawatt uh, electrolyzers in, at, at NEOM in the next couple of years. So it's a massive scale up and that, and that is part of the answer to, to the cost question. Thanks, Frank. If we do have more time, I have for more questions to you, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, Rami, uh, if you don't mind asking some, asking some questions. So first one I have was, you spoke about the carb circular carbon economy, which is a promising concept, but what about implementation? Who do you think will be driving the driving actors here? Or will they be the investors, the governments, uh, especially about in the GCC area? And the second one I have for you, what measures can GCC countries take to become competitive along the supply chain and catch up with other countries that are investing heavily in green hydrogen? Sure, uh, thanks to I. Um, I think to kickstart the, uh, you know, the hydrogen economy is uh, you really need government intervention uh, first. Um, you know, investors will not put money on the table unless there's a business case for it. And uh, governments should, uh, like I said in my presentation, to really give that, uh, you know, initial uh, kick and, and, and give them these policy signals that yes, there is going to be a marketplace for hydrogen. Um, if we look at the EIA's report, um, that was published in July on their uh, clean on their status of their the clean energy innovations. Um, they they mentioned that around 17 billion dollars of government money, this is public money, that went into uh, R and D for uh, low carbon energy. Around three quarters of that went into low carbon power generation uh, and energy efficiency. Now that's important, but if you want to tackle these big um, hard to abate sectors. You really need to focus on, you know, things like CCS, hydrogen, uh, bioenergy, and you know, electrification like storage and things like that. So right now, you know, the public money is flowing towards you know low cost power generation and energy efficiency, which is important. And you know, we've seen a lot of cost declines, for example, in renewables and solar because of that. Uh, but in order to you know bring down the cost for um, um, hydrogen, you know, we need to scale up. And uh, Frank said it, you know, we need to install more and more, but for investors to start installing more and more, you know, we need, you know, the government support needs to be there. And so uh, I think it, it should start with the government funding, you know, funding R&D, funding, you know, using private public partnerships, uh, offering grants or soft loans, things like that, and removing these barriers for investors to come in and, and, and invest. Um, in terms of your question about the GCC, um, I think uh, to be competitive, they're, they're already, you know, basically taking that first mover's advantage. Uh, you know, they're trying to build this large scale um, green hydrogen plant. Now with the blue ammonia and, or blue hydrogen, they're also, you know, piloting with that. And probably, you know, the next step is to go commercial with it. So um, they, they, you know, so far they, they can leverage on their, for example, oil and 
oil products uh, partners uh, to you know see if they can have some offtake agreements and sell hydrogen to those uh, uh, economies as well. So I mean they're already known as a reliable source of energy, and I think it would be easy for them to transition. Uh, I mean if hydrogen uh, would be exported or become a if this region becomes an exporting hub, it would be easy for them to kind of integrate hydrogen into their uh, product portfolio or their export portfolio. Interesting, uh, Rami, uh, that you say that. Uh, with regards to piloting, I do agree with you. There's a lot of piloting happening at the GCC in the production side of things. I haven't, I, I'm not too sure, but you could correct me if I'm wrong, but there, there's not a lot of piloting in the utilization uh, stage. So there's, there's no, uh, you know, um, big trucks uh, being, uh, you know, equipped with the fuel cells to run for a number of years as a trial. There's no uh, steel plants or cement factories being implemented. Is that because the, the GCC is positioning itself heavily on, we will make it to export it first, and then we'll look at internal market later? Or is, is there something that we're missing here? What's your opinion on that? I think it's the former. I think, uh, you know, they, they are looking now into, uh, you know, achieving scale. And to achieve scale, yes, you need to focus on your domestic demand, but there's a lot of interest also internationally for hydrogen. And, um, you know, they, they have the facilities. So with the, the one with the Aramco one, for example, they're basically retrofitting CCS into an already existing facility. I mean, the EOR is, is there, the ammonia plants and the SMRs are there, the pipelines are there. Sabic already has uh, the world's largest uh, CO2 purification plant. Um, so the infrastructure is there. And so what they are doing is that they're leveraging on it, which is basically the low hanging fruit uh, of decarbonizing their existing facilities. And you, you know, once you reach that cost competitiveness level, yeah, then you start looking at, well, where can I use hydrogen domestically? There's, there is a lot of opportunities, like you said, you know, there's opportunities to use it in steel, in mobility, especially heavy duty mobility, uh, maybe even power generation if, uh, you know, as a way to uh, substitute uh, uh, crude oil, or even it, it really supports their initiative to deploy renewable energy, uh, which is part of their vision 2030 uh to to you know uh, to become you know uh, supply 50 percent of their power with uh with renewables so there's a lot of opportunities i think uh, and uh, for hydrogen to penetrate domestically even well uh gentlemen thanks a lot for your time uh, we've we've reached the end of our hour here and i know we have a commitment right after it so on behalf of mashura group team i'd like to thank you for making the time to speak on today's webinar and shedding some light on this important topic I wish you all the best and have a great evening.